What about the obligations of citizenship and the needs that need to be addressed in the country that you don't get to if the question is, what are you passionate about? The second huge role that service learning needs to play, it's not just making available the menu of the 10 most exciting service projects that your students want to engage in. What about the needs that you don't come to if passion is the question? That was a challenge to us. I wanted there to be an initiative putting students in a personal relationship context to understand economic injustice, to understand the predatory nature of payday lending and title pawn shops. It's hard enough without then having to deal with industries created by college-educated Americans who come to your communities with the sole purpose of preying on you to get as much money as they can from you. Tax preparation in every state represented here other than New York, and it's gotten a little bit better in New York, is part and parcel to payday lending. Exorbitant fees, huge rates of negligence, and there are a thousand campuses with a small earned income tax credit initiative, VITA, Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. Some of the campuses represented in this room have them, and they're great. And they're usually told, the story is, this is something for an accounting club to do, you can make a little difference, help your resume, learn a little bit about taxes. That's not the story that our country needs out of that issue. What if you deliberately, completely retell the story to English majors, philosophy majors? This has nothing to do with accounting. This has nothing to do with preparing you to be a better accountant. This is what we say around the state of Alabama to college students all across the state. If you're passionate about children, I can give you 10 different things to get involved in in the fall. I think that's great. You feel passionate about homelessness or domestic violence, we can connect you through service learning courses and initiatives to make a difference. I support that. During January and February, I don't really care what you're passionate about. This isn't about you. This is about the single biggest federal anti-poverty program in the country that enjoys bipartisan support, which is why it doesn't get a lot of attention. It's one of those rare initiatives that Republicans and Democrats agree on. I don't know how many billions it brings in in eight weeks into Florida, mostly to parents, all of whom are working, raising five million children a year from below the poverty line to above. And it's intimidating and confusing. And 65 to 70 percent of low-income families go to paid preparers to do their taxes. And they're not going to accountants. They're not going to CPAs. CPAs aren't in the business of helping people who don't even itemize. That's how easy they are. They go to an industry with no training and no licensing and no oversight. It's literally the Wild West. On average right now, all over our states, they're charging $300 a pop for about 35 minutes of work. And so we say to the students of Alabama, and now we're moving into Tennessee, you're passionate about senior citizens, that's great, we'll set you up. During January and February, I want you to go through eight hours of training, take a two-hour test, and sit down four hours a week at a table with a low-income mother raising her children and help her keep from being abused by an industry created by college-educated Americans like you. And in March, you can go back to your passion. We have 570 students signed up last year, and we run 19 tax sites, and in about eight weeks, we prepared taxes for 8,500 mainly low-income working parents raising children, securing them $15 million of refunds, conservatively saving $2.5 million out-of-pocket costs. Pretty cool project for eight weeks of a bunch of 18 to 22-year-olds in a state like Alabama. And we have reflection exercises. And every year, and it's funny because the students think like they're the first one to have this insight, like they're, and every year, over and over. And in this case, even the liberal kids, across ideology, even the kids that think of themselves as liberal and compassion, they volunteer everywhere. What are your first senses from the last two weeks at the tax sites? I just had no idea how hard people work. In other words, even for the kids who would tell you they wouldn't have this bias, there's such a thundercloud over the country, culturally speaking, that tells us in 18 different ways a day that if you're talking about a family making $19,000 a year, Somewhere in that recipe is laziness. And I'll tell you this, there are lazy poor families, there are some lazy rich families, 
The vast majority of families living paycheck to paycheck, raising children with no savings, laziness isn't anywhere in the building. And to have an experience as a threshold, eye-opening experience as a freshman or a sophomore where you're at a table for 45 minutes going through the finances of a working mother, sometimes close to your age, with 30 hours at Sears and 30 hours at Home Depot because neither want to give you 40 hours of health care, that's a powerful experience to have during the winter as a sophomore in college. And if it's deliberately told as, this is something that's incredibly important to our campus. Our president reports these numbers on a weekly basis. We're incredibly good at this. Now, the last thing I would say is this. It's such a fascinating story to me, and I'm so proud of him for doing this, and a lot of you probably know this story. After the hurricane came through New Orleans, and it decimated, as you know, hundreds and hundreds of acres, including Tulane. And the entire school had to leave for the semester, including this huge new freshman class who were paying a huge amount of money to be there. And they ended up going to more than 100 campuses around the country, every one of which refused to take the tuition from Tulane, which I thought was a beautiful gesture. And so there are students from Tulane that ended up enrolled in campus, I'm sure some of them ended up on some of your campuses, all over the country. And it took a good semester, and even at that point when they were invited back, it still smelled bad, there's mildew everywhere, the city's a wreck, the neighborhood's messed up, the dorms are all screwed up. But at a certain point, they had the capacity to have students start to come back. Picture yourself as the administrator of that university and what the language you would use to call your students back would be. Because I think it would be hard not to feel apologetic. I think it would be hard not to feel like you sort of need to plead with them and <laughs> apologize and sort of try to rally your troops and, you know, we'll, we'll get this through to get, we'll get through this together. And, and this president takes a different approach. He decides at that moment to completely redefine the story. He doesn't apologize to anyone. He sends the word out to his students all over the nation. I certainly understand this has been a traumatic period for everyone. And I want to say my expectation is that a lot of you have, have made a home where you are. And I certainly understand that. I would love to invite all of you back to Tulane. But I want to make one thing clear. If you're not 100% fully prepared to make the rebuilding and renewal of this city the core mission of your university education, I recommend you stay where you are. If you're not ready to redefine what it means to have a degree from Tulane, and you don't feel that to the core of your being, don't feel bad. This is just not the right choice for you. If you're ready to embrace that as the mission, regardless of discipline, we need you to come home. And I don't know if you all would be surprised to know, almost all of them came home. And within three years, the number of applications to Tulane quadrupled. And then five times, and then six times. And you can hear them talk about it. It's the funniest story. Five years into this, they were so overloaded with applications, they hired a consultant to advise them on how to reduce it. They paid a guy, and his advice was, you need to add in two more essay questions that <laughs> that don't apply to any other university. There are too many of these common essays, and you need to make them really difficult so that students, they can't use them for any other university. That'll reduce it. Then you'll only be getting the students that really want to come to Tulane. So they did that. He went up again. <laughs> and I don't think, you know what that consultant didn't get? He didn't get the power and vibrance of the story that had been told and what that meant to that institution moving forward. Everyone here, I think, needs to believe to the core of their being that this is the most valuable work of higher education over the next generation. Regardless of the disciplines we all work in, this is the calling of higher education to prepare the next generation to have some semblance of a possibility of leading forward with an ethical, morally engaged nation. And until you're blue in the face to beat on your administration or the ones that are doing it already for you and being very supportive, 
to affirm them and to be part of the choir and not just an occasional initiative, but as something that this is one of the most meaningful things we do on our campus. This is the strongest, most lasting legacy of any of our works. This will have the biggest impression on any student that passes through these gates. And from this year forward, to graduate from this institution, it damn well should mean that you're ethically engaged in caring about other people's children who are unlike yours. That's what it means to come out of this school.